The most recent experience uh, highlights uh, uh, that uh, in response to the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, in response to the Great Recession, the United States first brought down short-term interest rates, they brought them down to essentially zero, and then they had a problem. Uh, you can't go much below zero, uh, but even at zero, the American economy was not revived. So they said, we have to do something stronger, and they tried to lower uh, long-term interest rates. They did that by buying long-term bonds, essentially financing U.S. government debt. Uh, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve increased fourfold. Uh, in the old theory, kind of monetary economics that used to be taught, uh, the effect of all this creation of money, liquidity, would have translated into more lending in the United States, and that would have translated into more ec economic activity, and would have contributed to the revival. But in a world of globalization, things don't work that way. With globally integrated financial markets, when you give somebody money, they look around the world and say, where's the best place to put that money? Where's the highest <coughs> return? And when they looked around the world, it was clear that with the United States in a deep recession, with our financial markets not working very well, the United States was not the, the best place to put the money. The best place to put people's money was in the booming emerging markets. The consequence was the liquidity went where it wasn't wanted, but didn't go where it was needed. And so the Fed helped create uh, bubbles around the world to help uh, increase the uh, capital inflows into other countries, causing inflation, causing appreciation of the currency, distorting the economies all over the world. Uh, then the question was, with these kinds of disturbances coming from outside the boundaries, how should the countries respond. And we see in country after country a whole rich variety of experiments of various ways of responding. Um, one of the traditional ways of responding was to raise interest rates. The problem with raising interest rates, uh, the raising interest rates was to dampen the inflationary pressure from the money coming into the country. But the problem of raising interest rates was that it made it even more attractive for money to come into the country. So the problem was that it exacerbated the instability. So Turkey, for instance, responded by not raising the interest rate, actually lowering the interest rate, but using another instrument. It raised the reserve requirement, made it, it discourage the banks from lending. Uh, Brazil intervened in another way. Other countries intervened by uh, trying to uh, intervene in the exchange rate to undo the, the effect uh, of uh, quantitative easing in the United States. Uh, all over the world, reserves build up uh, by the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars to the point where reserves now are, de facto reserves are probably over $10 trillion. Well, uh, what this illustrates is that we have a world in which we have become very interdependent. What happens in one country has very big effects on others. But our inter economic integration has outpaced our political integration. When the, what, what one country does has effects on others, uh, when when what one person does has effects on others, there is a need for what we call collective action, to act cooperatively, to act collectively. But we don't have the international political institutions which will facilitate that. So there's a need for coordination, but there is no coordination. And so that is why today there is a need for these capital account management techniques. The very good news is that the international institutions have begun to realize this. I 
I mentioned before the effort of the IMF to change its charter in 1997. Well, in 2010, it realized that that was wrong. And it actually endorsed the idea that under certain circumstances there be uh, capital account management. Um, it realized that there, that, that there were shocks uh, uh, that countries were being buffeted by and that they needed to respond. And they needed to respond by measures that were not just raising interest rates. Uh, there are a whole set of other tools that monetary authorities uh, need to take into account. Uh, changes in reserve requirements, in capital adequacy requirements, in loan-to-value ratios, uh, a whole set of, of, of instruments. So this is one of the real insights that have come out of the crisis. Uh, one of the uh, real ways in which uh, our thinking, policymakers' thinking, theoretical thinking, has changed dramatically as a result of the crisis. I want to list a, just a couple of other ways that, that our thinking uh, has changed as a result of the crisis. The crisis has also highlighted some deficiencies in the common models that were used. One of the very peculiar attributes of the models that became prevalent in most central banks and most policy circles was that they ignored the distribution of income. The models that economists used were called representative agent models where everybody was the same. These models are very peculiar. Um, for instance, my own research, as was mentioned, focused on uh, the importance of uh, asymmetries of information. It's just another way of saying that what some people know, uh, some people know things that others don't know. Well, when you have only one person in the economy, it's very hard to have asymmetries of information unless you have acute schizophrenia. <laughs> so this main body of work totally ignored the advances in in economics about the information asymmetries that constructed models in which these couldn't occur. A second problem that this kind of approach has is that it, there's no scope for financial markets. Because financial markets basically have one party lending money to another. But if there's only one person, it's like the left, park, uh, left hand lending money to the right hand. Not a very interesting transaction. And bankruptcy never occurs. Because if you bankrupt, you would only be owing money to yourself. But in fact, bankruptcy or the fear of bankruptcy was what caused the financial crisis. Each year, the banks in the United States knew that they didn't know their own financial position, so they knew that they couldn't trust any other bank. They knew that nobody should trust them, so why should they trust anybody else? And the result of that is they refused to lend to each other and the whole financial system froze. Well, you can only have that kind of a problem when you have a real financial market. And the models used by most central banks did not really have a rich uh, financial market, even markets with banks. So one of the problems was that these models paid insufficient attention to credit. Uh, they paid too much attention to rational expectations. And the basis of these models, they came to the belief that if central banks kept interest rates low, it kept inflation low, uh, it was necessary and almost sufficient for economic stability and high growth and good economic performance. Well, they ignored the real role and the importance of financial stability. Uh, in the aftermath of the crisis, everybody realizes that you have to focus not just on inflation, but financial stability, growth, and employment. Uh, and that if you take this broader set agenda, you're much more likely to have a more prosperous uh, economy.